And the title of the message is this morning, Would You See Jesus? Would you see Jesus? Scripture says, And there were certain Greeks among them which came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Listen, sir, we would see Jesus. The desire of these men was this, we would see Christ. Friends, this is the whole purpose of our gathering to worship every time is that Christ should be set before you, that His gospel should be preached to you, and that you by faith should see the Son of God. This is my heart's desire for every one of you, that you should see Christ, that you should believe on Christ, because there is no salvation apart from Him. None. None. There is no hope. There is no comfort. There is no joy. There is no life apart from you seeing and believing on the Son of God. Now, previous to this text of Scripture, our Lord Jesus had many times proved His deity by many miracles. But especially the healing of the man born blind in chapter 9 and the raising of Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11, our Lord proves Himself to be the Christ, the Son of God. Who but God could give sight to a man that was born blind? Matter of fact, nowhere in the history of mankind was ever such a miracle done that a man should be born blind should receive his sight. Now, there are many instances in which a man lost his sight in life, and yet he was healed. But this instance was very, was so rare. It was one of a kind. And yet our Lord did it with no trouble. And he not only proved his deity by this, but he also proved it by raising Lazarus from the dead. Who else but God could raise the dead? Only God could give life to the dead. And there Christ stood at the tomb of Lazarus and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb being dead for four days. He came out. Only God could do this. And Jesus did these miracles not just to prove his deity, but rather to preach to us the gospel. These miracles that he did, he did not do them as men would. Men do miracles and things so that they might receive glory for themselves. God, Christ did miracles so that God should be glorified. That the gospel should be preached. And that's what these miracles were. Take that healing of the man born blind. All men by nature are spiritually blind. Born spiritually blind. They cannot see the things of God. Now let me ask you this. Why are men not interested in Christ from birth? Why? Why do men have no interest in the things of God? Why, why are they interested in the things of the world? Why do they love the sin of the flesh and the lust of the flesh? Why is it that they seek after things that they can touch and feel and have no desire for the things of glory in heaven? Why? Because they're blind. They can't see these things. They don't see any value in it. They don't see any worth in it. They're blind. They can't see. They don't have any desire. You listen to me this morning. You have no interest in the things of God. I want you to understand, without question, you are blind and cannot see what we see. I enjoy these things. I relish these things. I long for these things. Why? Because I'm not blind. You believe you're not blind. You see Christ. You know Christ. You want Christ because you're not blind. But man by nature is born spiritually blind. He cannot see the things of God. Cannot know them. Well, how then... Can a man receive these things having never been able to see? Scripture says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things 
God prepared for them that loved him. Listen, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. How did God reveal this to me? The same way he healed that blind man. By grace and mercy, by power, he healed that blind man and he was able to see things he never saw before. And so it is with the sinner. The sinner who, who never had any interest in the things of God, God puts his, his, his word on our hearts and we see, we understand now that Christ is all. Christ is all. That's all my heart's desire is Christ. A natural man receiveth not the things of God because he's spiritually discerned. He's born blind. And so then, what's, what's the only hope? If you're blind this morning, what is the only hope for you? Now, I can't give you sight. I can't give you, I can't make these things interesting to you. That would be deceptive, wouldn't it? If I stood up here and did a play and, and, and you know, tried to entertain your flesh and tried to make you feel good, then that would be deceptive. I'd be trying to make you think you saw something. What is the only hope for a blind man is if Jesus Christ this day passes by you and gives you sight. That's it. And if he passes by you and he doesn't give you sight, you will never see these things. You will die in your sins and hell will be your reward. That is the truth. That is the truth. That man standing on the street corner begging was born blind with his cup out. He couldn't see if the Lord Jesus Christ walked right by him, that man would have never saw anything. The difference was Christ stopped. And he gave him sight. Now that's the gospel. This morning I'm preaching to you. If it ever goes to your heart, it's not me. It's Christ It does it. Second one was that dead man, Lazarus. He was physically dead. He could not give himself life. If I were to lay out a corpse before you and put all of the medicines in the world in front of him, what good would those medicines do if he had not life? And so it is with you who are unbelieving. You are dead in trespasses and sins. You cannot give yourself life. And I'm going to prove it to you. I've told you that Christ alone is the Savior. I tell you that He alone can give life. He alone, by His one offering can cleanse you from every sin that you have ever done or ever will do. I tell you to believe on Him and He will robe you in His righteousness, wrap you in His arms and be your eternal refuge forever and the justice of God shall never come on you. And yet, if you still refuse to come, I'm going to tell you why. You are dead. Dead. I just proved to you by your not coming, that's proof. You're dead. I've just told you the most wonderful thing that could ever possibly happen to you is if Christ would save you. And yet, you still will not call on Him. You still will refuse. Still. Why? You are dead. What is the only hope for the dead person? Is if Christ come by and call you by name. Now I tell you this, if Christ walks by your dead corpse and doesn't call your name, what harm did he do you? You are already dead. If you ever understand that you are blind and dead, this is good. Because only the blind need sight. Only the dead need life. And that's what Christ came to do. To recover sight to the blind. To raise the dead to life. So, you're in good company. <laughs> if God ever shows you that, you will call out to Christ and He will save you. He will save you.
But you should never try to come with your own righteousness. You should never try to give yourself sight. You should never try to give yourself life by obeying the law or doing good. Obeying the law and doing good never gives life. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God. Why? Because you have no righteousness. You have no standing before God in your works. God doesn't demand your best. That's what we as parents, we want our children to do their best. I want, I want my children to do their best. When they, they're doing something, I want them to give everything they've got. And if they come short, I, if I know they've done their best, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. God's not like that. God doesn't want your best. Because your best ain't good enough. God demands you to be perfect. Perfect. God demands you be as perfect as He is. Therefore, there is no life or sight in the law of God. But behold, God in grace, in mercy, for His own glory, has sent the only one who can give you life and sight. That is Jesus Christ, His Son. That Christ should come and fulfill the righteousness of God. That he should come and redeem Israel by the offering of himself. By giving his life. By putting himself under the judgment of God. By enduring the judgment of God for the sins of his people. He should give life and redemption. And I tell you that this is done. Listen, don't work for salvation. You can't work for salvation. Salvation's done. Salvation's accomplished. Salvation is in a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ. How do I know this? Because I tell you God raised him from the dead. We all have family members who have died. Friends who have died. Go out to their grave and what will you find? You will find them there. They're dead. But I can show you one too. That there was a dead man in there. But now he is not there. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one. Who has risen from the dead. Why? Because he took our sins. He paid for them. And because there was no sin. God could not. The death could not keep him in the grave. He rose again for the justification of his people. And now the Holy Spirit is sent into the world to call these people, to give sight to these blind, to give life to the dead. And so then, why will you not believe? This morning, as I'm presenting Christ to you, why will you not be like these men? These men heard something. These men had a need of something. And they came with this statement, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now this morning, would you see Jesus? Would you? Is there anything else you've came to see? If you came to see anything else, you've come in vain and your time here is wasted. Because only Christ can give life. Only Christ can give life. Scripture says, Rejoice for the hour has come, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall live. And now in our text, we see the result of his preaching the gospel, of his de declaration of his deity, of his, of his salvation. Here it is, these Greeks, these Gentiles who were proselytes to the Jewish religion. These men came to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover as it was required by the law that they should come. 
These men heard of Jesus' miracles. They heard of his message of salvation. And now they desire for themselves to see him. To see him. They tell Philip, Sir, we would see Jesus. And when God moves on the heart of a sinner to come to Christ, when his son, when, when a man's sin is exposed and God's holiness is revealed, no word of man, no religious deeds, and no amount of works can ever satisfy that man until he himself personally has Christ. I know this, when God convicted me of my sin, there was no place I could go to find comfort. All of the usual places that I found comfort in became thorns. They felt as though they pierced my soul. They used to give me pleasure. My sin used to give me pleasure. But the places I, I went to before for comfort, I found I could find no rest there. I could find no comfort there. The, the, they became ashes in my mouth. Everything began to condemn me. I was exposed before God. I was naked and there was no place for me to hide. This is what it is for conviction. When God saves a man, he must first convict him and convince him of his need. Do you have a need? If you don't have a need, you won't ever see Christ. I know a lot of people have a need of physical healing. A lot of people have need of food and shelter. And I tell you, God gives those things. He gives those things. He put, makes his sun to shine on the just as well as the unjust. But I had something, a greater need than just physical things. I had a spiritual need that nothing could satisfy until I myself had Christ. It was something my mom and dad could never give to me. It was something my preacher could never give to me. It was something only God could give. And I had to plead for mercy. I had to beg God for mercy. Knowing this, that I did not deserve any of it. All I saw was my guilt, my shame, my hopeless condition. But then at that same moment, I found peace. By looking to Christ. I said, God, I would see Christ. I would know His blessing. Give me His blood. Wash me in His blood. Robe me in His righteousness. And you know what I found? I found Him to be most gracious. Most gracious. These men desired to see Jesus. Is there any here desire to see Jesus and be accepted of Him and have eternal life? Then you must come. You must come alone. And you must come to Him alone. No one will come for you. No one will believe on Christ for you. You yourself must believe on Christ. It's very personal. It's very personal. You must come to Christ and you must come to Him alone. You must, as these Greeks, find the efforts of religion not enough. They came to Jerusalem. They performed the Passover. They went by the law. And you know what they found? They found it was not enough. It was not good enough. Their conscience was not satisfied. They needed something greater than the law could provide. They needed Jesus. They needed Christ. And so they came to Him. What does God require of thee? I like this. This, this old heathen king came uh, and asked uh, what, the, what the Lord required. 
He said that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Wherefore shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the Most High God? Shall I come before him with burnt offering, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with ten thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for the transgression of my, for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Isn't that what most men think? To get life, you gotta, you gotta do. You gotta sacrifice. You gotta feel pain. There were some people in the old church, they thought that by, they could whip sin out of themselves. They'd, they'd beat themselves. When they thought a bad thought, they would just hit themselves and hit themselves, thinking that they could get it out or something with the, some kind of suffering. No, God doesn't require that. God's told you what He requires. Righteousness. Perfect righteousness. Nothing else will do. Therefore, this is why enough is never enough. This is why these Greeks came to Christ. Because the religion was not enough. And you're going to find this. You who seek after, Christ, seek after God by religion, you're going to find out religion is never enough. And it's going to get old and boring and tiresome. It's going to get weary. Why? Because you're looking for that to satisfy God. And you're going to find out it's useless. I, was, I can't satisfy God. But listen, if God will ever save you, He's got to bring you to show you your need, your depravity, the vanity of self-righteousness. He must show you the blasphemy of all free will works religion. Now, do you do you desire to see Christ? Then I tell you right now, come near and listen. Come and listen. Here it is. And they brought this to Jesus. And look at verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Much fruit. When they came to see Jesus, what did Jesus give them? He gave them this message. If you desire to see Christ, you're going to only see him in the message of the gospel. In the message of the gospel. Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Here Jesus sets himself forth to be as a picture, a corn of wheat. Take a little grain of wheat, a little, little seed, okay? Now you put that seed over on a shelf, okay? It's a perfect seed. It's a good seed. But if you put it on a shelf, how much wheat will grow from the seed? None. If it abide alone, it will not produce any fruit. No matter how good the seed is. In order, in order for a seed to produce fruit, it first must die. And when you put it in the ground, the seed itself dies so as it might grow into multiple seeds. You've seen a stalk of wheat? A stalk of wheat comes up. It's a little seed. You plant it in the ground. It comes up. And then at the top, there, there are many seeds. So one seed produces what? Many seeds. And this is the picture. Jesus himself is the seed. Now then consider this. What if Christ just abided alone? Now he's perfect. He's God. I consider that if Jesus were not to come and die, who would be saved. No one. No one. Surely if Jesus were to left Adam in the garden, like he left the fallen angels, would he be any less righteous or good? No. 
See then, God is by no means obligated to save men. That's what people think about God, isn't it? Well, he made me. He needs to save me. It's his fault if I don't get saved. It's all... Listen, God's not obligated to save any one of us. God doesn't owe you anything. You owe God everything. But God in free mercy, in sovereign mercy, came down to fallen man. God came with a message. You remember after, sin, after Adam's sin, God came with a message. He didn't have to. He could have left Adam in his fig leaves. Let Adam die in his fig leaves and go to hell. He could have left him there without any uh, hindrance to his glory. But in grace he came. Came with a message. Not by the works or merit of man, but that salvation should come by the seed of the woman, which is Christ. That he should crush the head of the serpent. That he should destroy the works of the devil. That he, by the bruising of his heel, should save men. It was by sin that death came. By sin of one man, death passed upon all men. I've told you already that we were born spiritually dead. You know why? Because your father and my father in that garden sinned against God. And when he died, we all died. This is why we were all born dead. Because of him. By one man's sin entered into the world. And by sin came death. And this work, this is the work by which he should remove death and sin, that Christ should come, and by the bruising of his heel, which is speaking of his death, he should put away sin. See the horror of sin in the death of Christ. That nothing less than the death of the Son of God could remove sin. You not see how strong the chains of sin are? That nothing less than the death of the Son of God. You could die, your children could die, everybody in the world could die, every animal could die, and could not take away one sin. But this man came, and by his one offering, see the greatness of his offering, by his one offering he hath sanctified, perfected, obtained eternal redemption for God's people by His one blood offering. And you see that Christ, without Christ, no man could be saved. But here is the word of Christ. He said, if a corn of wheat should abide alone, It won't bring forth any fruit, but if it fall in the ground and die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Much fruit. Here's the word of God. See that by the gospel, it was God's purpose and will that Christ should come and die for the sins of his people. Jesus said that after his resurrection, his disciples were very upset. They, they just saw their, their Lord die. On the cross. They saw him buried in that tomb. And it was the third day. And they were walking on that road to Emmaus. And the Lord appeared to them. And they didn't know who it was. And he said, why are you so sad? What's wrong? They said, you don't know. This man we thought was the Christ. This man we, we loved and thought that he should, he should redeem Israel. He's died. And you know what the Lord said? He said, ought not Christ to have suffered and entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You not see that this whole book, this whole book here is given to us concerning the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ought not Christ to have died? Because that's the only way sin could be removed is by the death of the Son of God. And I tell you that he's come, he's died. He is the Passover lamb. 
And by His grace and love, He bore our sins in His own body, and God smote Him. God killed Him in our stead. Behold the reason for sin. The, the ransom for sin. The ransom for sin is this. That God killed His Son in the place instead of the guilty. And by His death, listen to the purpose of God. And when it died, it bringeth forth much fruit. The work of Christ was to die for the sins of His people, to suffer the just for the unjust. This was a divine work of God. Why? So that He might save His people from their sin. Jesus said this in John 10. He said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And listen... I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them I also must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ came for a reason. He had a purpose. His purpose was not vague but very specific. He came to die for the sheep. He came to die for all those that the Father had given Him. Therefore, the doctrine of universal atonement that opposes the Word of God is blasphemous. Those who preach the death of Christ is a failure. Those who preach that His death was the purpose to die for all of the sins of all men... And some of those men are in hell this morning. That is a blasphemous doctrine. That's not the doctrine of Christ. Jesus said, if this corn of wheat fall into the ground, it shall produce much fruit. I thought this very interesting. You know, the amount of seeds that a, that a, a wheat is going to, a seed is going to produce is already determined in the seed, isn't it? It's genetically determined in the seed how much that thing is going to put out. And this is the same with the gospel. Christ being the seed, he has already determined who he was going to save before he offered himself. We know this, that Jesus, our Savior, is not a failure, but rather a victorious Savior. That his death has accomplished salvation, obtained eternal redemption for all that the Father gave him. See then that Jesus in our text ties his glory to his death. You see that? Look, at, look back at uh, verse 23. He said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Well, how should he be glorified? By dying and producing much fruit. The Lord Jesus ties His glory to His death. You see, if Jesus failed in His death, then His glory fails. His glory fails. Will the glory of Christ fall? If Christ died for a sinner and that sinner died in his sins, then the glory of Christ would have failed even because he failed to give eternal life to as many as the Father gave him. But we are sure of his glory, even because the Father purposed to save the elect, and the Son died for the elect, and you listen, the Holy Spirit now is moving to save those people from their sins. The Holy Spirit is as sent to call the elect. Go to Second. Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. See the whole of this in chapter 2, verse 13. Paul said, We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, 
Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. You see that he chose you to salvation. You see, election is not salvation. It's unto salvation, but it's not salvation. Salvation comes by the obtaining by the work of Christ, but it comes in application by the Holy Spirit. Look, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. In other words, the Spirit of God must and will come to everyone that is dead, everyone God chose, everyone Christ died for. The Spirit of God shall come to them, and He will give them life, and they will believe. But what is the means? Look at this in the next verse. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so then, going back to the next one, going back to your text, look at the next verse. And we see in the next verse the effect. After the death, after the resurrection, after the calling, after he brings forth much fruit. You who believe, you are the fruit of his labor. You are the fruit of his death. Now what is the result of us who believe? Look at this. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto the eternal life. Now you listen, I've just preached to you the gospel of Christ, I've set him before you, and yet if you continue to love this life, you'll lose it. This is the result of the gospel. The gospel always has an effect. Listen, this gospel always has an effect on you. Always. It is either going to harden you, and you will go away worse than you walked in, or you will come away believing and rejoice. There's no middle ground here. There's no, this, this gospel is always doing its work. It's always going to do. And this is one effect of the gospel is that some of you will love this life. You'll love this life and you'll cling to this life and you'll hang on to this life and you'll want this life and you'll want the pleasures of this life. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to lose it. All that you hang on to, you'll lose it. Go ahead. Hold on to it. Haven't you already experienced this, everybody? Haven't you already experienced this? Enough is never enough. It's always the next thing. Isn't there always something more? You say, man, if I just had this one thing, then I'll be satisfied. And then you get it, and as soon as you get it, you're looking for something else. Tell me, is that not so? Is that not so? Every one of you, is that not so? You know it is. And you always want something more. Something more. But you get this. I want you to understand this. Everything you try to hold on to with your dear life, you'll lose it. You'll lose it. Your family? Have you not already lost? Your pleasures? Your treasures? Have you not tried to hang on to them and then just find them slipping through your hands? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Empty, empty, all is empty, 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 all is empty. That's the things of the world. But here's something and another effect of the gospel. He that hateth his life. <laughs> he that hateth his life. shall keep it. What does this mean? This has to do with a man who really understands what he is and what this world is. I know this, my sin, I hate my sin. I hate my sin. It is my desire now, being saved by the grace of God, to no longer sin. Yet I know this corpse of a nature still wraps its tentacles around me and drags me to the ground every single day. 
It's constantly at a warfare, constantly at a struggle. This flesh and body grows weary and sickly. The more we live in this world, we're going to find that the things and treasures of the world leave a bitter taste in our mouth. They're not what they are, what they seem to be. And the more we grow in grace, we, we begin to hate this life. That sounds strange to the people of the world, doesn't it? Well, you just need to be more positive about the things of this world. You just need to have a better positive attitude of things. Maybe so. But I tell you what, I hate this life. <laughs> this life is miserable. But I got a life that I'm looking for. It's not in this world. It's in that to come. I have eternal life. My joy is not found in this world. It's found in Christ. Matter of fact, the Lord tells us this. He says, when I give you my spirit, when I wash you with, your, with the blood of my son, he says this, then shall you remember your evil ways and your doings that are not good, and you shall loathe yourselves. <laughs> that sound familiar, believer? Do you loathe yourself? I do. But notice this. We not only loathe ourselves and shall keep our life unto eternal life. Listen. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Those who follow Christ desire to serve Christ. If we loathe this life, we have something that we do not loathe, and that is Christ. We love Christ. We hate this life. We love Christ. Therefore, in this life, we who believe on Him serve Him. Serve Him. He is our Master. And we have completely surrendered to Christ. What is it to serve Christ? Is it then to go back to the law? Because that's what some people think. To serve Christ is, well, you believe on Christ, you're saved by grace, but now you need to start going back to the law and living under the law. No, that's not serving Christ. How do we serve Christ? You serve Christ by believing on Christ. The just shall live by faith. Faith. You see, we have a law by which we serve Christ. It is the law of faith and love. It is not the law of works. You remember Paul called those Galatians who tried that. He said, you're so foolish. Are you so foolish? To begin by the Spirit and then go back under the law? No. We follow Christ, we trust Christ fully and completely and surrender all to Him. And notice this. He says, where I am, there shall my servant be. What is He telling us? We who see Jesus, what is He telling us? He said, where I am, that's where you are. He's showing us our union with Him. Now, how much is the seed in union <laughs> with the wheat? The wheat came from the seed. And you listen, we are in union with Christ that where He is, we are. Do you not see that when He died, we died? When He was righteous, we were righteous. When He rose again, we rose with Him. And right now He is seated in heaven and that's exactly where we are. We are in Christ, accepted of God, because we are in union with Him. I like this. Somebody once said, uh, you know, those people like to put that bumper sticker, smile, God loves you, on the back of their cars. And he, somebody said, well, what if Noah would have put that on the back of the ark? <laughs> people outside the ark drowning. And he said, smile, God loves you. <laughs> That'd be foolish. But one preacher said this, you know what you could do? You could put that sticker all on the inside of the ark. <laughs> you 
could, you could stamp that sticker on the inside of the ark all over the place. You could say, smile, God loves you. If you are in Christ, smile, God loves you. If you are in Christ, you are safe. And there is nothing that can harm you. He said, behold, I am thy eternal refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. I got you over the top. I got you around the side and I got you underneath and nothing will harm you. This is what Christ is telling those who would see Jesus. Would you see Jesus? If you would, it's what he says. In me, you're safe. Where I am, you are. Safe. Him will my Father honor. Do you not see Christ, that God honored Christ? This morning, I've been exalting Christ. I want to exalt Christ every time I preach. You, you, you don't even have to guess what I'm going to preach on, do you? When you come here, you know exactly who I'm going to exalt, not you. I'm going to exalt Him. Why? Because the Father honored Him. And you get this. The Father will honor Because I'm in Him. God honors His people. Doesn't He? Yes, He does. He said, I'll honor Him. My Father will honor Him if He's in me. So then I ask you again, would you see Jesus? If you find yourself dead and blind, when you find your religion is not enough, I know this. If you ever have a need, Christ is the only one that can give it, fulfill it. He alone can save. You should believe on the Son of God. And in believing, you have eternal life. Forgiveness of sins. May God bless this to your hearts. Let's stand be dismissed in prayer.